I'm Pastor Tom, and welcome to the Sunday Sermon. You got to move. You got to move. You got to move. You got to move. You got to move, child. You got to move. You got to move. Because when the Lord gets ready, you got to move. If you don't mind, I'd like to ask you to stand while I read the scripture to you from Genesis chapter 21. I'm actually reading a lot of the chapter, so you're going to get pretty much the whole context. The Lord visited Sarah just as promised and did for Sarah what God had said what's going to happen. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the very set time of which God had spoken. And Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, and called his name Isaac. Then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded. Now Abraham was 100 years old when Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made me laugh, and all who hear will laugh with me. And she also said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? For I have borne him a son in his old age. So the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. Now, Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom Hagar had born to Abraham. It says here, scoffing. I'll get to this in a minute. This is a common English translation. It says scoffing. It's not actually accurate. So think of that as a teaser. She saw um, Ishmael scoffing. And therefore said to Abraham, cast out this bondswoman and her son, for the son of a slave shall not be heir with my son, with Isaac. Now, this was very distressing to Abraham on account of the fact that, well, Ishmael was his son. But God said to Abraham, do not worry because of the boy of of the slave, Just go ahead and listen to your wife, for your ancestors will be known through Isaac. But I will also make a nation from the son of Hagar, because he is also your son. So Abraham rose early in the morning, took some bread and a water skin, and put it on her shoulder, and gave the supplies and the boy to Hagar and sent her away. And she wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. And the water in the skin was used up. And she placed the boy under a shrub. And then she went and sat down across from him at a distance of about a bow shot. For she said, I do not want to watch my son die. And she lifted up her voice and wept. God heard the voice. And the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said to her, what troubles you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of your son over there where he is. So arise, lift him up, hold him with your hand, for I will make him a great nation. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and she gave some to her boy to drink. So God was with that boy, and he grew and he dwelt in the wilderness. You may be seated. I know. I read that story, it got really quiet in here, because that's not a good story. You may not have even ever have heard this story before. Have you heard the first part? Well, you might not have heard the second part, so let me fill you in on this sort of historical backstory. We have to go into the Wayback Machine. Good, some of you know that one. <laughs> we go into the Wayback Machine, set it for 3,000 years ago. We come to this world uh, 4,000 years ago, three, 4,000 years ago, and we come to this world in which Abraham lives, 
And you'll recall that Abraham desperately wanted a child. That was his number one existential concern. If, if at any time God were to say, Abraham, what's your deal? He would have said, I need an heir. That was his, that was his thing. And so um, God was promising him and reassuring him that this was going to happen. And so as a result of that promise, and as a result of, now this part we know more from um, archaeology than from the scripture, but apparently there was a, a marriage contract between Abraham and Sarah, and it's very specific kind of marriage contract that existed in that world where um, the agreement was she would be his only wife. He would only have one wife, but she would guarantee an heir and was responsible for that happening. And so at some point, I assume Abraham went in and said, well, God told me I'm going to have a kid. I'm going to have an heir. I'm going to have a son, <laughs> you know? And so uh, uh, Sarah fulfills the obligations of the marriage contract, providing a, a surrogate, this slave girl named Hagar. And I got to remind you of this part of the story because when Hagar becomes pregnant, suddenly Abraham becomes somewhat fond of her. I don't want to say he fell in love with her, but, you know, he treats her kindly. And Sarah loses it. Loses it. She's so hurt, angry, jealous. It's so that all of those feelings that she's had for all of those years, being the woman who's not able to give birth to a son, to any heir, never getting pregnant, that the shame of, in that culture, the shame of that is just comes out all at once, and she goes nuts. She's cruel to Hagar. Hagar runs away. God finds Hagar in the wilderness and says, it'll be okay, I'm going to bless you, don't worry, I'm watching over you and your son, it'll be fine, go back. And Abraham, in response to Sarah's um, outburst, is like, what have you up here? Well, you've got to fast forward a few years. <clears throat> um, so if we, if we do the math, the text says that Abraham's like 100 years old, when uh, Isaac is born, but understand that the way they, what they meant by a year was different than what we mean by a year, so he would have been 50. So he's 50, um, and then when you start doing all the other math, what we know then is that uh, at the time Isaac is born, um, Ishmael is about five maybe, five or six, right in there. Some of these, you can't quite be 100% accurate on some of these numbers, but we, got, that we can get pretty close. So in when God comes to Abraham and, and sort of introduces, like, I, no, you know, um, I've, I've come here to let you know I'm going to bless you with an heir. And Abraham's like, I got one, Ishmael. He's doing great. He's already in kindergarten. Look at him. Strapping young lad, thanks. Uh, God says, no, I have something really remarkable in mind. Sarah's going to get pregnant. By the way, I, I, you know, I told you some of this story, but there is a whole thing that I left out where Sarah overhears some of this conversation, and she's like, no way, man, that's not going to happen. Uh, there's, there's lots of little games being played around the name Isaac, which refers to laughter, so... Uh, there's a story earlier where, where Sarah's like cracking up at the prospect, you know. She, she must, I think she was looking at herself in the mirror at that moment, probably just gotten out of the shower and go, no way, no way, that ain't going to happen. Uh, so it does, because God, God has said, God introduced, says, I'm El Shaddai, and that name, and in that context, stresses, is connected to ideas around fertility. It's a name that's connected to ideas around fertility. In Genesis, later on, it, the meaning of the name changes in its use later, but in 4,000 years ago, it was about the power of fertility. And this is when circumcision gets introduced, and this is, you know, God's way of saying, you know, you have to surrender the human effort. You tried that already. And instead, we're going to do the divine way, the supernatural way. And so sure enough, now she gets pregnant. Sarah gets pregnant. She has a child. This is fantastic. And in obedience to the commandment, 
Abraham circumcises Isaac on the eighth day. Now, I've thought a lot about this. Why the eighth day? That seems odd, especially because in Scripture, the number eight's not a number that shows up much. It's always sevens and threes, and, but eight? Why eight? And, and I realized um, that if you are circumcised on the eighth day, what that means is, regardless of what day you were born or what time of day you were born, by the time you're circumcised, you will have been alive for one complete Sabbath and one full week, which means you survived the first crisis of living in this world because infant mortality was huge back then. And, and part of what helped me realize that was that the very first baptism I ever did was a, a child who had just been born. I was um, hospital chaplain. It's the last thing. It was the last of my field training coming out of seminary. I was a hospital chaplain. And I, I was on call. I had a pager that existed back then. I just headed home. I get the buzz. I have to turn around and go back. And um, it, was a, it was a child who was like, stillborn. And they wanted... The parents wanted their, their little one baptized. So I come walking in, and they're, you know, they're doing the... It's terrifying to watch compressions being done on a newborn. So I, in fear and trembling and grace, I, I did this baptism. It was a remarkable moment, because I'm getting off the topic of the sermon, but I, this is just stunning what happened. I was baptizing this child, and... The idea was that they were going to keep doing the compressions. As soon as the baptism was done, they could stop because you don't baptize after someone's heart has stopped and after they're dead. And as soon as I was done with the baptism, I heard the doctor say, well, that was strange. His heart started beating as soon as you baptized him. He only lived like two more days. The healing grace in that moment was that God gave those parents a couple of days. It's a remarkable thing. Isaac has survived the first week, and that's pretty cool. Uh, but they're still on pins and needles because in the ancient world, sure, surviving childhood is kind of a big deal. And so the next marker, the next moment is when the child is weaned. So weaning, this would be sometime like he's two, maybe three at the latest, somewhere in there. And when that finally happens and he's weaned, they have a party because now it looks like he's going to live. He's actually going to survive into adulthood. And at this point, their party's going on, and they have this toddler, and you have the older brother who's at this point seven, maybe eight years old, somewhere right around there. Um, and they're, okay, so I read what the text said, scoffing. And the reason that comes up is because um, the behavior of Sarah and everyone involved seems pretty horrible, and yet uh, the, there's always this tendency to explain it away and sometimes make it okay. So obviously, we have to figure out, what, well, he, he must have been bullying or teasing his little brother. That's what was going on. Ishmael was teasing or bullying his little brother, and, and it was just, she was just being a mom protecting her little boy. It's not what it says. It actually says they were playing, playing. Now, I'm not good with the Hebrew, so I can't look it up in the Hebrew and go, yeah, see, it says playing. But I looked at the translation into Greek, which was made um, three centuries before Jesus was born, and it says playing. They were playing. The brothers were playing together. But at this moment, Sarah now has a son. She's confident it's going to live, and she loses it again. And she loses it because... Um, all of that shame, all of that fear, all of that jealousy, all of those negative feelings that she struggled with are just back. And they may have been there the whole time. She may have just been biding her time until she felt like she could trust that her son was going to survive. But she loses it, and she's, what she's saying... I don't, I, I don't want this family to have anything to do with that woman and that child. You know, it almost sounds like Abraham had had an affair as opposed to Sarah had 
brought her maid to Abraham as a surrogate. It almost sounds that way, doesn't it? And I have actually known uh, families where it wasn't even necessarily affairs, but where, where someone, uh, you know, a, a, a person ends up marrying someone, and then their, their new spouse is like, oh, you know, I don't want you to have anything to do with the children of that woman, so this is, or of that guy, and so that suddenly you have a spouse who's cut off from their own children. That's where, that's where Sarah is at. And Abraham's like, ah! doing what Abraham does. Ah! I, I'm still fascinated by this guy who can defeat, it, will take an army of 300 and go and attack an enemy in order to rescue his nephew, but is terrified of his wife. And, and I don't actually think God, in, in, I don't think this is um, when God says, don't worry about it, Abraham, it'll be okay. I think God is reassuring Abraham. I don't think God is saying, this is my will for you that she should, that Hagar and Ishmael should leave. I think God is going, oh, another broken situation that's in need of massive grace and assurance, and this is not going to fix easy. I just want you to know, Abraham, that your son is going to be okay. That's, that's what I think is going on. That's my personal take. So, you got to wonder uh, why in the world this happens. You know, what, I mean, you might want to say, what is Sarah's problem? And, and you wouldn't be far off, but you really would be asking, what is our problem? Because Sarah's not really ask, acting a lot differently than we do. Because Sarah's operating in a world where she believes uh, that this is a zero-sum game, that there's only so much love to go around that the problem is there's not enough love. There's not enough love in that family for both Ishmael and Isaac. And for her, love is defined by inheritance, being an heir. But that within that family, there's just not enough love to go around. That it's a limited thing, and the only way that her son can get the love he deserves, and by extension, the only way she can get the love she can, deserves, if there is no competition for that love because there's only so much love. And we do this in churches all the time. I mean, that's why we have denominations. If you look at denominations and have conversations, what you realize is that a lot of it is about who's included and who's not. Today is World Communion Sunday. Do you know why we have World Communion Sunday? Because we can't actually get together and do communion. We can't do communion together. Because churches everywhere define, like, well, you, we can't do communion with you because you're not included. We, we draw these lines around the table and we say, there's not room at this table for anyone but our kind. There's no space for anyone else but us. It's a zero-sum game. That's what, that's what we've come to believe. Our denominations are, by definition, a realization of that, that, it's a, that we think it's a zero-sum game, that God only has so much love to go around, and we need to carve out who's on the inside, us, and everyone else can be in the outside because if they came in, that would mean less love for us, right? And we see this also in our culture when people resist, uh, like, giving rights to somebody in, like, just politics. And someone says, well, let's give the people the right to do this. And everyone's like, well, you can't do that. Like, like if somebody has a right, that somehow takes something away from me. It doesn't take something. No, it's not a zero-sum game. Love is not a zero-sum game. Um, my, uh, uh, my daughter uh, has, both of, our, both of our kids have friends they've had forever. Uh, our daughter has a friend from, I, since she was in at least fourth grade, but probably younger than that, and they've been friends forever. And she, she, she'd had a fiancé, they were, they hadn't gotten married yet, but they'd been together for a few years, and, and he had died. So here she is about 30, and she's basically a widow. And then a few years later, she met, uh, well, actually met again. It was a guy she'd gone on a blind, blind date with, and they hadn't hit it off. But somehow they crossed paths again, and they did hit it off. And they fell in love, and they got married, and they now have a really cool kid. I mean, it's just, they're great. And he, he's wonderful, she's wonderful. They're a great couple. And I, she posted something some, uh, some years later, I think reflecting on all of this, all of her experiences you know, the, the experience of, of having loved this one guy and then having had him die and the love that still remains in your heart. 
and now there's another person that doesn't cancel out the love, doesn't push it away. And she, she said this, she, she posted this. She said, love is expansive. It grows exponentially. There's nev you're never going to run out. It is an inexhaustible resource. Why? Well, the Bible tells us. God is love. That's a lesson you probably need to learn. Can you please stand and find the prayer of response? We're going to pray that together. We constantly struggle, Lord God, to secure our place and stake our claim as though love is in short supply. We make our denominations and choose up our sides. We slice and dice our theology to determine who is counted and who is discounted. And in the effort, what have we become except loveless schemers competing for scraps of meaning and validity? Yet all the while, your love abundant pours down unheeded. Teach us to love, truly love, before it's too late. In Jesus' name, amen. We'd love to have you join us for Sunday worship at 8.30 at the Christ United Methodist Church or 10.15 at the Stanton United Methodist Church. Until next time, may the Lord God bless you and keep you. May the face of the Almighty be upon you. And may God grant you peace. When the Lord gets ready, you got to move. Oh, you got to move.